وكذلك أوحينا إليك روحا من أمرنا ما كنت تدري ما الكتاب ولا الإيمان ولكن جعلناه نورا ولكن جعلناه نورا نهدي به من نشاء من عبادنا وإنك لتهدي إلى صراط مستقيم صراط الله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض ألا إلى الله تصير الأمور بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to yet another episode of Fundamentals of Faith. In the last episodes, we discussed the meaning of uluhiyya, which is the fact that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves our worship. And we also defined and translated la ilaha illallah to mean that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order to fully understand the meaning of the kalima, we now have to define what an act of worship is. What is worship? What is ibadah? We said that an ilah is one who is worshipped. And we said that there is no deity that is worthy of worship except Allah. So to put in the last piece of the puzzle to understand la ilaha illallah, we have to define the meaning of the word worship or ibadah. And this will be our topic for today. So I hope you stay tuned inshallah. Today's topic is about the meaning of the word ibadah or servitude, worship. Ibadah has been defined linguistically to mean a state which combines the perfection of love, submission and fear. Love, submission and fear. So whenever you love an object and you submit yourself to it and are scared of it, you are worshipping that object. Imagine now any person that goes to any false deity a cross, a crucifix, a stone, a rock, that person will feel in his heart a love of this object. And he will feel at the same time humility, humbleness. And he will also feel a fear of rejection. He is scared that that object might be angry at him if he doesn't obey him. And this is ibadah, worship. This, this is worship from a perspective of the one who is doing the worship. How does he feel when he is worshipping? He feels his state of love, and a state of submission and humbleness, and a state of fear. There is another way to define ibadah as well, and that is what should the worshipper do? If you like, you could say there's a psychological perspective, and this is what we just said, and then there's a physical. Well, what does he do in order to do that worship? Well, from a shari perspective, ibadah or worship is defined to be any belief, statement, or action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do, or is pleased when we do. This is what worship is. Any act, statement, or belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. Therefore, worship is a very broad and comprehensive term. A very broad term. Anything Allah is pleased with, this is an act of ibadah. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ even said that when one of you has relationship with his wife, this is Sadaqah, you'll be rewarded charity. The Sahaba were surprised. They said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, one of us satisfies his base desires, his lusts with his wife, and he will be rewarded for this? And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Do you not see that if you had put what you had put into haram, if you had some, done something haram, would this not be a sin? They responded, Yes, it would. So he said, Therefore, this is when you, when you have inter intercourse with your wife, when you have relationship with your wife, or the wife with the husband, this is an act of worship. So, we see that the act of worship is not like in other religions, restricted to a few movements, a few bowings and prostrations. No, it is a broad and comprehensive term, all-inclusive, of any belief, any statement, and any act which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with. This is very important for us to realize, because when people commit shirk, or when they associate partners with Allah, this is why they do so. They don't understand what ibadah is. So for example, when you see people going to the graves and asking the people in those graves for help, making dua, 
You ask them, how are you doing this act of worship to the grave? They will say, no, dua is not ibadah. I'm not praying to it. I'm not giving zakah to it. So they understand ibadah to be restricted to a few acts. You can list it on a small list. But this is the problem. Ibadah is a comprehensive term, like we said, which encompasses all that Allah loves and is pleased with. For any act of ibadah, of worship, to be acceptable to Allah, there must be two conditions of this act of worship. Two conditions. At the same time, there should be three motivational factors present in every person. There are two conditions and three motivational, fa psychological factors that must be present in the person. So we will discuss what are these two conditions and what are these three factors and we'll bring evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. The first evidence or the first condition is that when you do this act of ibadah, it must be done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must desire to please Allah and only Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ translates as you alone do we worship. You alone do we worship. وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And your help alone is the help that we seek. So you alone do we worship, we don't worship anyone else. Likewise, Allah says in Surah Bayna verse 5, that وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِعَبْدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدين. They have only been commanded to worship Allah sincerely, making the religion to Him alone. Sincerely. This is the first condition. Anyone who does any act of worship to other than Allah, that act will be rejected from Him. It doesn't matter how big it is. A person builds a hospital, he builds a masjid, he distributes a thousand or a million Qur'ans, he prays all day, he prays all day and night, he fasts every single day, but he does so in order to please mankind or to show off, Allah will reject it from him because there's no sincerity. This is the first condition. The second condition, the second condition is that every single act that that person does must be based upon the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the first condition is ikhlas and the second condition is it must be based on the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran surah Ahzab verse 21 that indeed you have in the conduct of the Messenger of Allah a perfect example to follow. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ forever, who, For whoever wishes to achieve the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in Surah Nisa verse 65, by your Lord, O Muhammad, they will never have iman. They will never have faith until they take you as their judge in all that they differ concerning. And they follow your commandments and rulings while they have no discomfort in their hearts and they submit totally to your judgment. So the second condition is conformance with the sunnah. This means that nobody can just come and say, okay, I want to worship Allah, let's do X, Y, Z. No. You have to show us that the Prophet ﷺ did that act, therefore you go ahead and do it. So these two conditions then are, number one is sincerity, and number two is conformance with the sunnah. Anybody does any act, while these two conditions have not been met, that act will be rejected from him. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does any deed, which is not in conformance with our actions, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna, fahuwa rad, it will be rejected from him. Whoever does any deed which is not in conformance with what I have come with, with my actions, with what we have agreed upon, it will be rejected from him. So these are the two conditions, preconditions of ibadah, and we said that there are also three motivational factors that must be present. These motivational factors, they go back to the definition of ibadah. Love, fear, and hope. Love, fear, and hope. These are the three condition, uh, three motivational factors that when a person worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he must have the feeling of love, he loves Allah. The feeling of fear, he is scared of Allah's punishment. And the feeling of hope, he expects the best from Allah. He expects Allah to accept his good deed and reward him for it. So these are, if you like, the motivational factors or the driving forces of the true believer. So let's discuss each of these three conditions one by one. Number one is love. The person must have a divine love. He loves Allah. He loves the divine. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the believers and the disbelievers. He says in Surah Baqarah verse 165, There are amongst people, those who take partners besides Allah, and they love these partners like they love Allah, equivalent. Then Allah describes the believers, and He says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ But the believers, they love Allah more than these disbelievers love Allah. Because their love is pure. Their love is pure to Allah. Whereas the disbelievers, the non-Muslims, their love has been divided. If they love Allah, they also love others than Allah in this type of love. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, there are three things, whoever has them will taste the sweetness of faith. The first one was what? that he loves Allah and His Messenger more than he loves anything else besides this. And of the signs that a person loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he loves what Allah loves. So when Allah loves the Prophets, we love the Prophets. When Allah loves the believers, we love the believers. So there's a love of Allah and there's a love for Allah. A love of Allah, you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one, unique. No one can enter into this category. This is the divine love, love of Allah. Then you have a love for Allah. You love those whom Allah tells you to love. So the prophets, the angels, and all of the pious people, the martyrs, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, we love them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to love them. This is the first of the three conditions. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back to discuss the other two conditions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Perspectives. I'm your host, Musa McGuire. There are 11 million, you know, not 1 million, not 3 million, 11 million people, uh, children under five that die every year. I mean, it's mind boggling and nobody cares. It is an action uh, and the movement from the people's side. You cannot press a button and say, well, stop at this point. Well, they have been hurted. And that is a reaction. We can go to those big countries and we tell them, you are producing this TV or this machine and this small part of it, I can make it better, smaller and less expensive. So while Islam would allow in vitro fertilization outside the uterus from uh, the uh, a married man and woman and then implanted in the uterus of this woman, Continuing in our discussion of the three motivational factors of ibadah or worship, we mentioned the first one as being love, and the second one is fear, and the third one is hope. When we say fear, we mean that there is a divine fear, a secret fear of the heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might punish us if we disobey Him. This is what we mean by fear. Now obviously people are scared of things, natural things. If someone is... You know, he sees a dangerous animal, a scorpion for example, or a snake. Obviously, he will be inflicted by fear. But this is a natural fear. Obviously, this is not a problem. What we're talking about is a supernatural fear. That you are scared that if you disobey Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might punish you. Now, let me give an example of a fear that qualifies as shirk. Suppose a person of another religion, he does something which he shouldn't do. And he thinks that his idol or his God will punish him. This is a divine fear that he has of a something other than Allah, a supernatural fear. This is what qualifies as shirk. So the fear that we have of something supernatural, it must be only of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran verse 175, Verily this is shaitan trying to strike fear into his friends. So don't fear them, but fear me, Allah is saying. Don't be scared of other things. Don't be scared of other gods or deities. Only fear me in kuntum mu'minin if you are believers. This verse is a condition. If you believe in me, then fear me only and fear nothing else. Supernatural fear, obviously, besides me. Likewise, in Surah Ahzab, verse 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes what happened in the battle of Ahzab when all of Arabia had gathered to attack the Muslims in Medina. And they were a small amount of people. 
So some of the munafiqun, the hypocrites, they came to the Muslims and they tried to inflict fear into them. And they said, Inna nasa qad jama'u lakum fakhshawhum. All of mankind has gathered to attack you. Aren't you scared of them? Be scared of them. They're trying to cause fear to enter their hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them as saying that uh, nothing happened to them except that their iman went up. Their iman went up. They were not, they would not fall prey to the whisperings of shaitan. Fazadatum iman. They were not scared of these things. Because they knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect them. There's also a very beautiful hadith. Uh, if you can give me a Sahih ibn Hibban volume um, 1. There's a beautiful hadith which also discusses this point. And the, Ibn Hibban when he compiled this book, he tried to compile only the authentic hadith. However, his conditions were not as strict as the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim. Therefore, uh, we have other, other categories of hadith as well. Hadith which are not that authentic as compared to Bukhari and Muslim. So the level of Ibn Hibban in terms of authenticity is not to the level of Bukhari and Muslim. There's a beautiful hadith here which Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa narrates and she says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever tries to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by displeasing the people. In other words, he wants to please Allah but that will cost him something. He will have to do something which will cause other people to hate him and dislike him. So whoever tries to please Allah by displeasing the people, then Allah will be pleased with him and the people will be pleased with him. But whoever tries to please the people by displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will be angry with him and the people will be angry with him as well. So whoever tries to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that means that he'll have to do things that will get him into trouble, quote unquote. That will get him looks and stares. Or people will talk about him. Or he might even lose his job or his, his life or anything. But the pleasure of Allah is foremost. Then this person, Allah will love him. And Allah will make it such that the people love him as well. Whereas, if a person puts the love of the people and the fear of the people before Allah, and he tries to please the people by disobeying Allah, he doesn't want to practice his religion because people will make fun of him. Or he's too embarrassed or he's too shy. And he tries to please the people. But at the expense of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will be displeased with him. And Allah will create the hatred of him in other people's hearts. And this clearly shows you that the mu'min, the true believer, he only has a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't fear the people. His fear is directed to the punishment of Allah, he is scared of falling into disobedience so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not punish him. The third of these three matters, like we said, is hope. Love, fear, and hope. What do I mean when I say hope? Hope means that you expect the best from Allah. You expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your good deeds. You expect that He will forgive you on the day of judgment and you will enter paradise because of Him. Because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To despair of the mercy of Allah, to despair, to give up hope, to think that Allah will not forgive you, this goes against this concept of hoping the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran that when uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam was told uh, of the destruction of Lut, and the story is long, but basically Ibrahim said, قَالَ وَمَنْ يَقْنَطُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّهِ إِلَّا الضَّالُونَ No one except the wrongdoers will give up hope of the mercy of Allah. Who is there that can give up hope of the mercy of Allah? Likewise, Ya'qub alayhi salam, the father of Yusuf. Ya'qub, the father of Yusuf, he too, alayhi salam, he too says the same thing. He too says the same thing, is that there is no one that can give up hope from the blessings of Allah except the kafirun. إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرُونَ He is hoping that Yusuf will be found. It's a long story, but when you go back and you look at him, he is hoping beyond hope that Yusuf is still alive. And this is the hope I'm talking about. You hope the best from Allah. So he says, who can give up hope of the mercy of Allah and the pleasure of Allah except for the kafirun? In fact, so important is this concept of having the best hope from Allah is that when a person is devoid of this, when a person gives up hope of the mercy of Allah, he is in fact fallen into a major sin. 
if you can give me uh, volume 9 of uh, Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir of Al-Tabarani, uh, this book, Al-Tabarani, Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir of Al-Tabarani, was written and compiled by Sulaiman ibn Ahmad ibn Ayyub Al-Tabarani, who died in the year 360 Al-Hijra. What he did was he wrote three books. Jazakallah khair, ya khair. He wrote three books. The Mu'jam, which means the compilation, Al-Kabir, the big, the Mu'jam Al-Awsad, the medium, and the Mu'jam Al-Saghir, the small. So he wrote a large book, a medium book, and a small book. And that's what he called it. Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir, Al-Mu'jam Al-Awsad, and Al-Mu'jam Al-Saghir. In this book, Al-Mu'jam Al-Kabir, what he did was he compiled every single narration he came across. Whatever he came across. So he compiled over 25,000 narrations from the Sahaba and those after them. And this is one of the largest books of hadith in print. And he's also a later author, 360. Most of the uh, compilers of the Sunnah were in the 3rd century, 250 around. As for him, he was a later author, so he's able to travel more extensively and uh, benefit uh, from the other sources to a greater extent. So one of the hadith narrated here is a beautiful hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that, and listen to this, this is a beautiful hadith. The greatest of all sins, the greatest of all major sins, Akbarul Kabair. You know that sins are minor and major. Here the Prophet ﷺ is saying the greatest of the major sins, Akbarul Kabair, is number one, to commit shirk with Allah. Okay, number two, to feel security against the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, you feel that Allah will never punish you. This is a sin because you think Allah is not capable. A'udhu billah. Number three, to give up hope of the mercy of Allah. And number four, to despair of the help of Allah. To give up hope of the mercy of Allah is a sin. You think Allah cannot have mercy on you? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor. How can you not think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you? So to give up hope of the mercy of Allah means that, A'udhu Billah, you think that Allah doesn't have enough mercy for you. Who are you and what are your sins compared to Ar-Rahman? How much, what do you expect that you have done that Allah cannot forgive you for them? Do you think that your sins are greater than the mercy of Allah? A'udhu Billah. So to give up hope of the mercy of Allah is a major sin. And one verse which combines, or some of the verses which combines all of these three conditions are the first verses of Surah Al-Fatiha. We say for example, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that He is worthy of praise because we love Him. You praise someone because you love Him. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim means He is the most merciful. So this shows you that we expect the best from him. Maliki Yawmiddin, the master of the day of judgment, we are scared of him. Love, fear, and hope are combined in these three verses. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, because of the fact that we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, he is because he is the merciful, we hope the best from him. Maliki Yawmiddin, he is the master of the day of judgment, so we're scared of his punishment. So based on Love, hope, and fear. Iyaka na'bud. This is how we worship you. Ibadah. Iyaka na'bud is based upon love, hope, and fear. So we've come to the conclusion of today's talk. To summarize, there are two basic preconditions for any act to be accepted by Allah. Number one is that that act be done for the sake of Allah. And number two, that the act be in conformance, in accordance with the Prophet ﷺ sunnah. And the three motivational factors when we do an act of worship are love and fear and hope. Now true love means that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of who He is. True fear means that we stop committing sins because we're scared of Allah's punishment. If we go beyond this, it's extremism. And true hope is when we strive with all of our efforts and might to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then hope that Allah will accept it from us. If we don't strive and we don't act, then this type of hope is foolishness. So we have to avoid going to the extremes. There's always a middle path. And the scholars have given a beautiful example of these three things. They said it is like a bird flying. Where the, the body of the bird is like love. And its two wings are fear and hope. Only when the bird has its body, the heart, and the two wings will it go forward. So too is ibadah. Love, fear and hope must all coexist together for that ibadah to be pure and sincere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've come to the conclusion of our allotted time. We hope to see you next time. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.